Yeah, I'd just like to um, start, before I hand over to Paola to start the presentation, I just wanted to acknowledge all the people who've contributed to this um, report and the process behind it. So we had um, four expert panel members, Nicola Jones, Linda Mayu, Patrick Nolan, and Caroline Pinder, and they did um, the reviews of 70 in-depth reviews of, the re um, of evaluations. We'll, you'll hear about that in a minute. We also had research assistants from Carla, Paula Avila, Agnieszka Malachowska, Jessica Jacobson, and David Walker, and Ella Page coordinated the search process. So we really want to thank everybody for their support. And then from DFID, we had Zoe, who's here, Harry, who's also here, and Claire Crum, um, who supported the process right from the beginning, have put an awful lot of effort into it, and have been um, really excellent partners to work with. So just uh, wanted to thank. So I'll just pass over to Paula, who will start the presentation. And you can see her. No, you can see the presentation. Yeah, and her. Good. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I hope that you can hear me. Uh, if there's any problem with the audio, then, um, Georgia, I can see the panel members. So if you can just give me a signal. If you can't hear me, that would be useful. Um, um, Georgia and I will, will uh, present jointly, so I'll start and then I'll hand over to her in some parts of the presentation. Um, and so uh, the, the report that we're presenting today is called Review of the Evaluation Approaches and Methods Used by Interventions on Women and Girls' Economic Empowerment. So it's quite a complex title. Um, uh, the present, we will present on several uh, relevant points of the study, why, why this study took place, uh, some definitions and scope of the study, the uh, brief overview of the methodology. Uh, we will present some key points of the evaluation landscape, then go into detail of good quality evaluations and results from these good quality evaluations, which were shortlisted. And we will finish by giving some uh, recommendations uh, that we derived from. Um, just uh, to start, we're um, in slide three. Sorry. That was the structure there. Yes. Um, so the, the aim of the study, why we did this, was uh, to contribute to more effective programming that delivers stronger positive impacts across different dimensions of women's and girls' economic empowerment. Uh, so we, we strongly believe that it's important to inform better evaluations that will inform better program and policy design, and also to improve uh, evaluation practice in this very important field of work on women and girls' economic empowerment. Uh, next slide. Um, George is going to talk a little bit more about uh, the conceptual framework that we use for the study and some of the definitions. So I'll hand over to her on this slide. Yeah, so um, everyone has an idea about women's economic empowerment and what it is. But I think we have lots of different definitions and different sources for those definitions. So we had to scope a bit of different literature on women's economic empowerment. And um, we, what we wanted to do was figure out what the process of economic empowerment was, rather than thinking of it as just a, a state of being. Um, so we ended up by developing a kind of sample theory of change, which you can see in the annexes of the report, and I'll, I'll just show you a bit of it. Um, but one of the things that, um, for, for those people who think of women's economic empowerment as just as earning money and ha getting jobs, um, we just w um, wanted to make the point that, you know, women's um, employment and income earning and businesses are very much tied up with their personal lives, their reproductive responsibilities and household responsibilities, which is the norm in many of the countries that we work in. Um, and so what happens is that when you're talking about economic empowerment, you need to look at what the barriers are, not just the, e the barriers related to access to assets, but also the barriers that are, rela that, um, are specifically related to the, what women are um, experiencing. And we have talked about that as the um, 
so, and we and we this comes from ICRW definition of women's economic empowerment, but it's economic advancement and women's power and agency. So those two things together not only um, underlie the definition of women's economic empowerment, but also um, should be used when doing analysis, background analysis of what the what the barriers are to women earning income and um, and uh, having a better livelihood overall. Um, so, um, so I mean, for this reason, we have we have talked in the report about a holistic approach to women's economic empowerment, and we've looked at, um, and I, th I think it's really important to think about the different levels, the individual capa capability, the communities and institutions, also political and legal environment. And we did find, and you'll hear about this in a minute, that there's a, a quite a lot of focus on individual capability, but not much in the other areas. So d doing that analysis at all levels is really important. So understanding how women and girls' economic empowerment works at those levels. And this is just the, um, you know, very simply economic advancement plus eco um, power and agency. If we can remember those two things, that it's how they interact and how they're working together. Um, and then also um, understanding what some of the cross-cutting barriers are that might not be related to the actual economic activity, so much more related to household, um, sexual reproductive health, education, a range of different barriers. Not that you would might necessarily include these in a women and girls economic empowerment project or program, but you need to understand what those barriers are and, on, and in order to understand how this process of economic empowerment will take place. Um, and the other thing we've, we've concepts we've looked at in terms of the change process is is looking at these issues of power different levels of power so it's the um, power within power to power over and power with and we've described I won't go on because I'm probably taking too long on this slide already but um, we've described how this relates specifically to economic activity in in the document so I'll just pass back to Paola for the next slide Paula, can you hear me? Yes, sorry, I was on mute while you were okay. speaking. So, um, so uh, when we uh, set out to do the, the analysis and review of the of the evaluations and studies in this area, we focused on eight thematic areas. Uh, so financial services, business and development services, skills training, asset provision, social protection, unions and coll collective action, trade and access to markets, regulatory and legal frameworks. Uh, and in, in many cases, as we will talk about in, in a minute, um, we found uh, evaluations that had a combination of these, uh, of these thematic areas, so they were not purely just one of them. But uh, when we conducted a search process, we made sure that we, we looked uh, systematically on all these eight thematic areas. Uh, in, in the next slide, um, I'm talking, um, I'll just talk briefly about the methodology uh, that we use, the methodological approach. Um, it's outlined in the paper, but also you can find it in detail in one of the annexes. And all the annexes have also been put online in the project's webpage, so you can um, read them if you're interested. Essentially, we used uh, uh, a review with systematic principles. So not strictly a systematic review, but something very similar to, to this process. Um, and we, we started by, uh, by doing an extensive review of uh, web-based uh, sources uh, through a structure of um, keyword searches along these thematic areas, but also in terms of combinations of women, girls, economic empowerment, and so on, which you can see in detail in the annexes. Um, and we also look purposefully at some specific websites, so for example, World Bank or JPAL and others. Uh, and we uh, sent emails to a, a number of, of, of expert uh, evaluators, practitioners, uh, people in donor agencies that work in this area to uh, be sent relevant uh, evaluations that might not be published. So we amassed a, an important number of um, 
evaluations and studies. Uh, we then uh, now uh, screened the, these according to some criteria, such as when they were published, they needed to be published after 1990, had to be in English, they had to refer to lower and middle income countries, uh, and also uh, they were they had to be evaluations, reviews, midterm reviews, etc. So from this uh, initial search, we had 382 papers, which we then uh, narrowed down to 254 by focusing only on empirical um, evaluations. The rest of them uh, might have been, for example, systematic reviews or others, which we didn't include for the analysis. Uh, in the next phase, we screened uh, based on two different tools that we developed on the basis of existing tools, such as the uh, mixed uh, methods appraisal tool, the MMAT. So we uh, did an adaptation of these to ensure that we were capturing uh, qualitative evaluations. Uh, and, and based on, on, on these two tools, we first screened for the amount of methodological information available, and then uh, some elements of quality and detail of this uh, methodological information that would allow us to do the reviews. And that screening process resulted in 70 shortlisted uh, reviews, um, evaluations and reports that were then reviewed by an ex expert panel in, in the next phase. Uh, we used EPI uh, reviewer software um, for the database and managing some of the details. And as um, Georgia mentioned at the outset, we had a really uh, committed team of uh, research assistants helping us in this process. Um, so after having done this, we, we in, in, in the report, we have two levels of analysis. So, so the first one I'll present, which is um, the evaluation landscape based on the 254 um, empirical evaluations uh, that we analyzed. Uh, and in those, I'll talk about the types of programs, who commissioned the evaluations, methodologies used, the geographical coverage, uh, some of the uh, economic empowerment outcomes that we identified, uh, some issues with evaluation questions, and just some general points on trends and gaps. And after this, um, then I'll uh, pass over to Georgia so that she can talk in more detail about the 70 shortlisted uh, evaluations. Um, so in terms of types of programs, uh, in, in the next slide, you'll see a chart that, that uh, highlights that <laughs> um, the majority of them, 54% of the uh, reports included, uh, focused on financial services as their main thematic area. Many of the reports, as I mentioned earlier, combined different areas. So financial services was often um, combined with skills training or business development and so on. So uh, there were very few cases in which they, they focused just on, on financial services, but there were several that did. Um, and, and so this chart uh, shows also that some areas, for example, like asset provision and regulatory frameworks had very few um, evaluations included. So uh, these are areas where uh, a specific uh, focus on, on how these areas are impacted on, on women and girls um, is lacking. So it's not a very evaluated area. Uh, um, yes, uh, so this is just the, the overview of, of the thematic areas. On the next slide, we uh, it uh, looks at who commissioned the evaluations. Um, out of uh, the 254 evaluations, 71 of them did not specify commission commissioning agency. So it was um, so we weren't able to say who who had commissioned them. 24 of the reports were linked to academic institutions, either by independent um, academic researchers who conducted their own studies or they were commissioned by uh, academic institutions. But there, weren't, there, there wasn't one single academic institution which commissioned a majority of them. Um, out of the rest, um, the chart shows the 10 most common commissioning agencies. So ILO, we've, we found 16 reports uh, by, uh, commissioned by ILO nine by Oxfam. There were seven of a series of uh, studies commissioned jointly by uh, Allsaid. Well, then Allsaid, now uh, uh, it, it's changed the name, and DFID, and so on. So you can see sort of the pattern of the most frequent donor agents commissioned, commissioning reports. 
Then um, this is an interesting uh, pie chart which illustrates uh, the distribution of, of methodological approaches used in the 254 reports uh, included. So 97 of them uh, used ex exclusively qualitative methods, 77 used uh, quantitative methods only, and 71 used mixed methods. There were, there were nine of them that were unclear in the methods used or they used methods which didn't fall in these categories. Um, something that we noted that was quite interesting is that when we then did the short list of 70 evaluations, the, the distribution changed quite a lot and it turned out that there were more uh, quantitative evaluations included in the short list, so 31 versus um, only 13 qualitative methods evaluations included. Uh, and this is uh, because we found uh, that most qualitative evaluations really don't provide a detail of the methodology. So they just say, well, we used qualitative methods, and they never specify what types of methods, the type of sample, uh, how they designed the sample. And we found this to be one of the important weaknesses in, in qualitative methods evaluations, which needs to be uh, addressed and strengthened. But um, so this is the distribution of the 254. Then in terms of geographical coverage, um, most of the, uh, or the greatest share of the reports found were in South Asia, 35% and 30% in Sub-Saharan Africa. Within South Asia, most evaluations took place in India, 50, 56 of them, and 33 in Bangladesh. And they focused mainly in, in the area of financial services. In Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we, we found uh, evaluations across the region, but uh, most reports um, were in, in Uganda, 29 of them, 20 in Kenya, and 15 in Tanzania. Um, we found around, um, well, 10% were global studies, which covered more than one country in different regions. And in the case of uh, East Asia, um, Vietnam was the country with most evaluations, 12 of them. Um, and 9% of the total evaluations were in East Asia, 11% in, in Latin America, and the other two were um, uh, very small, Europe and Central Asia and Middle East and North Africa. Um, so the next slide, in terms of women and girls economic empowerment outcomes, when we were doing the initial classification and coding of the reports, we developed a, a list of of outcomes based on what we were observing that uh, were the com most commonly reported outcomes in the evaluation. So economic advancement, individual capabilities, which in could include uh, the abilities to do specific type of, of work or sort of develop uh, uh, the ability to do their own business, economic decision-making power, ability to organize with others, access to finance, access to markets, improved regulatory frameworks, and well, some that didn't fit in the codes above. So we classified the top 254 according to the types of economic empowerment outcomes identified. And well, this table obviously doesn't add to 254 because in most cases, more than one outcome uh, resulted from the intervention. Um, but this was um, the, the distribution. So in, in the, the most commonly reported outcome was economic advancement or income generation. Um, there were, uh, yes, so that that's for that. Yeah. Then the next slide talks about the evaluation questions. Uh, we we coded for whether they included, uh, the reports included or not an evaluation um, question. And um, roughly about half of them did and half didn't, 54% uh, did, but <laughs> surprisingly 45% didn't, which is quite high. Um, and we found that it tends to be related to the sort of the detail and the quality of the analysis. So in many cases where the question is not specified, then um, it's difficult to then understand what's trying to be uh, explored. Um, of those that did have evaluation questions, uh, not all of them had questions that focused on women and girls' economic empowerment. This depended on whether the reports were sort of mainstream reports that looked at something else as the main focus and then had just a, a component exploring women and girls' economic empowerment. So for example, it could be a report looking at fair trade and the impact of, of fair trade on poverty with a very small component 
exploring uh, how this might impact on women, uh, women's economic empowerment. In this case, it was generally not the case that they had a specific questions uh, on, on women's and girls' economic empowerment. Um, and, and so we, we, we did find that in general, when these questions were specified from the outset, then it meant that the detail uh, level of depth in which the, the, the dimensions of economic empowerment were explored was greater. Um, so those are the main points in terms of the uh, evaluation of the, the landscape of 254 reports. Um, in terms of just overall trends, we can say that 46% of evaluations focus primarily on financial services and effects of, on women and girls' economic empowerment. Uh, interventions, particularly the ones that were uh, seen as successful ones, promoting women's and girls' economic empowerment, generally combine services across different thematic areas. So as I was saying, they might combine financial services with skill development or business development and so on. Uh, relatively, there was a relatively even balance in terms of the types of methods used, uh, with 30% quantitative, 38% qualitative, and 28% mixed methods. In terms of gaps, uh, only 21% uh, of evaluations and studies in our database focused on adolescent girls. We, we see this as a very important gap. Uh, we thought that we would find more. And then what is even more striking, as uh, Georgia will talk about later, is that there were even fewer that, that met the quality criteria to be in the shortlisted evaluation. evaluation. So I think it's 9% that were shortlisted. So there's a death, dearth of evaluations and studies on economic empowerment uh, impacts on adolescent girls. There's a growing uh, body of, of, of work in terms of pro programmatic interventions in this area, but we definitely think that there should be greater effort to evaluate in this area. Um, there's relatively few evaluations and studies included from the following regions, so Latin America um, and the Caribbean, East Asia and the Pacific, and the Middle East and North Africa, and Europe and Central Asia. We feel that, particularly in the case of Latin America, the fact that we restricted to searching evaluations in English might have left many out because there, there were several that were published in Spanish, but also in the other areas, um, particularly because many of the commissioning agencies are English speaking, there is really uh, not a lot of, of evaluations in this area. So there's certainly scope to increase evaluations in, in these regions. Um, there's few reports uh, found in the following thematic areas, so legal and regulatory frameworks, unions and fair employment, and asset provision. Um, and uh, our analysis su suggests that this can be because many of these interventions don't have, uh, are not targeted at women or, or the evaluations ref are, are undertaken with a gender blind approach, which is something that needs to be uh, corrected. Um, and so uh, I'll now hand over to Georgia for the next part of the presentation. Yeah. Hi, so um, yeah, we, um, we then, after looking at this whole huge database, we narrowed it down to 70 of the evaluations and, and research documents ha that had the best quality information and that had the best quality methods. So um, bearing that in mind, we might have missed out some that was really good quality but just didn't have the information in the documents for us to make any assessment at all. Um, and we had, in order to, for the expert reviewers to do their job, we had developed a template which we had um, used the um, some DAC um, material on, you know, what's a good evaluation, DFID evaluation policy, um, and bond um, material, as well as a, a two or three other key documents on evaluation. Um, you know, methodology, and then also our background on women and girls' economic empowerment. So we, we combined these to have a set of questions on a template, and the experts had to both, they had to score um, against two main areas of, around the evaluation quality, and then they had to answer um, about 10 or 12 key questions um, in a qualitative way and um, so we had both some quantitative information and some good quality analysis of the 
of the um, reviewed evaluation. So the, the information I'm talking about now is just about this 70 that we did um, more in depth um, review of. Um, uh, what we found was that about 54% of the reviewed evaluations did not have robust methodology that was evaluating women and girls' economic empowerment. It was either partial or, or um, the ones that, you know, that weren't any good um, or, or wasn't very um, complete at all. Um, and um, also, in addition to that, we looked at um, oh, I don't know why these aren't in order. Sorry. <laughs> Just put the second one up. 12 out of the 70, about 17%, had a partial approach to women and girls' economic empowerment. So they looked at change in terms of economic advancement only. So that's something that we were looking out for, is whether there was this holistic approach, which <coughs> we had um, were using that term. Um, and even when these um, evaluations were looking at um, a holistic approach. So they were looking at change in power and agency as well. Um, they tended to, to focus very much on decision-making power in the household. So they didn't necessarily look at the community level. They didn't necessarily look at men men's attitudes and behavior towards women and girls' economic empowerment. They didn't look at institutions. In fact, we only had two of the evaluations that were looking at women's decision-making impact power at institutional level and those were related to the co-ops and fair trade um, projects so it you know it's quite interesting that there's there's not this sort of holistic multi-level approach um, nor in terms of uh, changes in norms and behavior was and in changes in in women's power and agency was there an um, an understanding of the different ways in which women's um, power and agency can be can change. Um, in some cases, um, there was um, there was a even though there was a um, <coughs> sorry, I'm, I'm lost the thread here. Um, <coughs> Oh yeah, so even when an, an intervention itself had a holistic approach, we picked up that sometimes the evaluation was only looking at one particular <laughs> issue. So you might have a, um, a finance, a microfinance um, methodology that included groups, so having women's groups providing microfinance, and that they only looked at how the microfinance was being um, applied and didn't look at the group methodology and whether that was um, contributing to women's economic empowerment. So there was even, if there was a more holistic approach in the project, you would, might not have, um, okay, a, um, a holistic approach to the evaluation. So I'm going to zoom through the next slides because we've taken far too long. Um, so 59% of the evaluations had a, I'm just I'm gonna talk about context, but the context analysis. Um, so 59% of the evaluations had a good quality context analysis, but even then, and, and when we, we talk about a good quality, it's a really uh, thorough understanding of the context, but even then, they very rarely did a thorough gender analysis, and that was sometimes because there wasn't gender expertise in the, in the evaluation team. Um, and they... Um, and, and just some of the things we picked up about what was a good context analysis were the ones that really looked at the institutional, the political, the economic background, and a whole range of levels. Um, and um, in terms of when gender analysis was done, it was generally just about differences between the sexes and not looking much more deeply about where those are coming from and the processes that were, were taking place. Um, Astoundingly, the um, the um, not all of, not all of the evaluations, and this was, these are the good quality ones. Remember, not all of them were gave a good description of the intervention. Only forty four percent presented a clear theory of change. Twenty six percent had no theory of change at all. Um, quite often, the theory of change was. Um, didn't include a good understanding of how gender um, differences and gender processes can change um, and um, and also might not have a um, a 
analysis of changes in norms and behavior. But we found across all of the ones that scored really well was that they were the ones that had a very good analysis at the theory of change and understanding of the process. So um, essential. Um, okay. I don't know how I'm going to do all this in five minutes. <laughs> Um, uh, overall conclusion, mixed methods is really important. Um, quantitative is really important for, um, you know, understanding what the cause, the attribution, and to generalize findings, but is not good enough to understand why and how um, change has taken place. So mm -hmm. qualitative is really important. So mixed methods, quite often we found that the that these, even when there were mixed methods, the two were being done separately, so um, they were not triangulating, nor were they use, uh, using qualitative findings to give a much richer understanding of the gender um, analysis. So, so that was um, a bit of a failing. But when mixed methods did work well, um, they, that, that, those were the best um, scoring um, evaluations. Um, and clearly indicators to measure change in women and girls' economic power and agency were better quality if they were multidimensional across the different levels, and we didn't, we didn't see much of that. Um, in terms of sampling, um, again, there was, um, it's really important to have information about and justification of the sample size and the sampling strategy. And I mean, some of these things are common throughout different kinds of evaluations. But quite often you would get, you know, oh, wim women, or and and it wasn't you were, wasn't targeting different types of women who had different types of economic activities, or looking at different age groups, different stages in the reproductive cycle, or anything like that. So um, that's really important. Quantitative evaluations, because they have to define the numbers much more closely, did have a better. Um, description of sampling um, and we, we would have liked to have seen a lot more detail of the qualitative um, qualitative sampling. Um, of there also there were very few evaluations with men and boys um, interviewed and as we said before there were very few that made it to this stage that were evaluating changes in um, economic empowerment to, to girls. Um, tools and data collection. There were really very few tools. There were, I don't think I saw one qualitative <laughs> data collection tool. There was a small number of quantitative ones. Um, sometimes, even if there was good quality methodology, the design of the instruments was not ideal. Um, and data collection methods there was there was very little description of how this was taking into account day, um, gender so for example the um, gender of the interviewers the conditions under which people were interviewed in whether it was in the family home who was present um, different kinds of um, considerations to take into account in the way questions were asked um, there was n ver very little explanation of that in most of the um, evaluations um, I says it's sa all sounding terribly negative. Um, <laughs> so uh, quality mm. of data analysis, very little disaggregation of data by age. Um, there were, uh, as I said before, there were, there were quite a few examples of where quant and qual data was presented as, as different parts of a, of a project and evaluation and not um, using triangulation or, or joining up and presenting findings um, in an integrated way. Um, even though women, uh, women's voices obviously had been listened to during an evaluation, there was very little presentation and analysis of this um, in the reports um, using things like quotes and stories. There were a few, and they, and they really enriched the reports when we saw them. Um, Self-reflection, um, uh, when we saw this taking place in an evaluation report, it tended to score a bit higher. It's in terms of uh, being a bit self-critical, understanding how the gender of the interviewer and the evaluator might impact on, on the findings, etc., and the, and the methodology. 
And then I know this is this is a hard thing to do, obviously, within documents that you find online. But we, I think, we found you know two or three that had um, an explanation about how the findings had been used, but um, you know, and how they had been disseminated. But very little. And I think it's so important for um, for you know for for people who are reading things in to understand that that whether they actually have been used, whether a project has been changed, whether a program has developed further. And, and whether women's lives have changed as a result. So um, that was lacking. Um, we're nearly there, galloping through this. Um, I'm going to suggest, since we're so, sh so <coughs> short of time, because I was going to go through all of the evaluation findings here. So I'm just going to do it very briefly. I'm going to suggest you read the report on this one. <laughs> um, so financial services, um, you know, one of the big findings, and there were so many evaluations done of financial services, mostly microfinance, um, but if you do microfinance on its own, you're not going to necessarily get women's economic empowerment, and this came up again and again. If you do it with other interventions, and this also came up for the social protection, it was a very similar finding. If you if you combine with, with, with particular activities that purposely designed to increase, um, you know, women's capability, their ability to network, leadership <laughs> skills, um, business skills, a whole range of different things, then you're more likely to get economic empowerment happening. Um, same for business development services, um, linking with, with wider, um, wider services is important. But um, there, there were some useful findings in terms of um, uh, you know, we're working with producer organizations. And in fact, this links to the trade and marketing and collective action. So where business development services seems to have most impact in terms of empowerment was where they linked to, to collective action and um, cooperatives and that, that kind of thing. Skills development, interestingly, for adolescent girls, there were some useful findings. Um, but when it's combined with, uh, what do they call it, life skills, has much bigger impact. Um, and social protection, I already mentioned. Legal and regulatory frameworks, as we said, there was very little on this, but what was, was found was fairly mixed. But there have been impacts on access to land and therefore women's um, access to assets. Um, I'm not going to go into the recommendations for programs because I could go on for a while there. Do you want me to stop? Are you going to stop um, me or do you want me to go into recommendations? Um, I think probably another two minutes. Okay, two minutes. Yeah. All right, we'll skim through these. Um, some of them are just obvious and lead on from what we've just done. Make sure there's a good theory of change. Make sure you have gender expertise on the team. Undertake context analysis that has a full gender analysis mm -hmm. and that covers the different levels, not just the individual level. Um, yeah, mixed methods. Um, base the indicators and tools in the valuation of uh, on the local knowledge. And I think this is really um, <coughs> important. Also, make sure you build in time to do proper triangulation and have a very clear purpose for the different methods, the different mixed methods you're using. Um, that some of these obvious, just you know, make sure design tools are for different age groups and different genders, disaggregate data, and um, provide this self-analysis. Then recommendations for commissioning agencies. Um, I think it's you know one of the things that was very clear, and I think you know a lot of agencies are doing this a lot more now. Is start designing evaluations with project implementation right at the beginning. Um, <coughs> be more purposeful about designing evaluations for women and girls' economic empowerment, and also focus more on the quality of methods and expect more from evaluators um, in terms of what they can do and what, what they're expected to present on in terms of their methodology and why they're doing it. Um, and also make sure there are concrete recommendations in the evaluation. Thank you. That's all. <laughs> Thank you very much.